New Zealand, with lush verdant landscapes often used in film and extensive native wildlife conservation programs. New Zealand is a nation that strives to embrace our unique endemic ecosystems, whilst maintaining economic growth and provide for our growing population. What happens if these interests collide? When forced to choose, where will priorities lie? So let's find out, shall we? We have to go back. Back to the Battle of Stockton Mine. Let's start off by introducing the parties involved. Solid Energy New Zealand, formerly known as Coal Corporation, is a state-owned enterprise with a long and storied history of being the largest coal miner in New Zealand. In 2004, with growth in the Chinese economy, they swapped from being a coal exporter to a coal importer. They skyrocketed the price of coal. Always on the lookout for opportunity, Solar Energy seeks to capitalize on this. Their CEO is Dr. Donald McGillivray Elder, self-described as Don Elder. Now, for the thought on their side, the Safe Happy Valley Coalition. They are an environmental protest group, one that focuses on open cast coal mines. With limited funding and resources, they are a small group relying on audacious life-threatening protest tactics alongside silly publicity stunts to try and garner attention for their cause. With regular trespassing and protest action, the media and government are against them, not to mention Solid Energy, who happens to be their primary target. Forest and Bird, New Zealand's biggest conservation organisation, they focus on using lawsuits and outreach to try and protect nature in all its forms, be it land, air or sea. Less radical than Safe Happy Valley, they have a number of corporate sponsors and are able to work directly with the government to protect the environment. Some of their work with the government include direct conservation projects and pest control initiatives. The local West Coast communities, home of Naitahu Iwi, with a proud mining tradition from the very start. With high rates of unemployment and a declining population, the region is struggling greatly into 2004. With all that out of the way, let's turn back the clock. It's 2003, and the highly unique snail, Wolefanta Augusta, is discovered for the first time. A rare and highly unique carnivorous snail, one that has learned to adapt to the highly acidic, poorly drained region, being able to survive where most other snails would never stand a chance. They have been adorably described as eating earthworms like spaghetti. The problem? They have been found right on a deposit of highly valuable rich coking coal, the price of which continues to rise. Looking to mine the snail's coking coal, Solar Energy applied for consent to expand the H.O. Stockton mine. Safe Happy Valley, coordinating with Forest and Bird, began a protest at the Solar Energy headquarters. Safe Happy Valley then go even further, digging up the Solar Energy front lawns searching for coal, as people dressed as Kiwi enter the headquarters and relocate Solar Energy stuff away from the mining area. The West Coast Regional Council and the Boiler District Council grant Solar Energy permission to mine. Solar Energy then applies for a permit to move the snail, stating they will mine regardless, snail or no snail. For the permit to go through, they need permission from the Minister of Conservation and the Minister of Energy. Preemptively, Forest and Bird lodge an appeal, only to find a key witness pulled at the last second, an expert in the environmental management plan and the impact of the proposed mine. Digging into it, we find that the experts pulled due to a relationship between their company, Landcare Research, and Solar Energy. When the expert asked for permission to take part in the court case, Solar Energy was informed, with Don Elder personally intervening. Regardless, the court case continues. Forests and birds state the potential damage to wildlife, with animals like the rare Great Spotted Kiwi, the highly territorial, they wouldn't leave even with their habitat being mined, and animals like the snail wouldn't even have a chance to leave. Solar Energy counters by offering an extensive predator control and restoration program. They claim that the predator control program will improve the overall numbers of both species, even after destroying the habitat, since they're offering to control a larger area than mine. The restoration program would use direct vegetative transfer, using machinery to excavate and dump vegetation onto restored sites. The plan was supported by land care research experts, having been brought in by Solid Energy. Expert Dr. K. M. Lloyd dismissed their plan, stating that it would not succeed, not with the unique local ecosystem. While the case rages on, Safe Happy Valley works outside the court, occupying the Solar Energy headquarters and lock themselves inside of it with bicycle locks. Two protesters are charged with illegally being on a building. They are released, but with fines to pay. They fall out by blocking the railway tracks to the mine, with two protesters chaining themselves directly to the tracks and one hanging above the tracks, hoisted up with a tree. 
They managed to hold up three trains for the police to arrive. Three protesters are arrested and charged with trespass. The environment court rules in favor of solid energy, and the mine moves one step ahead. Solar Energy's request to move the snails is granted by both ministers. The wildlife permit granted will allow them to mine up to 96% of the snails' habitat. Safe Happy Valley then attempts a series of last-ditch court cases. At the request of the court, the Department of Conservation snail expert, Dr. Kath Walker, is supporting them. Solar Energy brought in eight separate experts as witnesses, each with a specialized role for the various ecological concerns in the mining zone. The Safe Happy Valley representatives were not as knowledgeable as the scientists, nor did they have access to the mining site to prove their points on the highly specialized ecology of the region. As a result, they were easily defeated in court by Solid Energy. The Solid Energy team even went as far as to attack Dr. Walker's credibility, an action that was rebuked by the judge as unjustified and misplaced. Knowing their strengths, they visit the mining site, camping in open defiance of Solid Energy. In the middle of the night, the Solid Energy security team pays them a visit. They take pictures and videos of everyone there and preemptively issue trespass notices. Next morning, the security team returns, but in more numbers, blocking access to the mine. The protesters attempt to leave, but are caught by a group of police, who let them go in exchange for personal information. The snail transfer begins, but instead of finding 250 snails, they find 6,000 snails and about 1,000 eggs. With only 8 fridges being available, the solar energy team is overwhelmed. The workers, alongside volunteers, have to move the majority of the snails using chili bins. The snails are sent off to Hokitika Laboratory to await their fate. 4,000 snails and 1,000 eggs are returned to the best possible areas. The remaining 1,500 snails are kept in the lab as an insurance against extinction. At Hokitika, they are kept in luxury conditions to encourage breeding. With a max capacity of 2 snails per system of container, a nice soft bed of moss, and 4 to 6 worms a month, their survival rate in captivity is an excellent 94%. The snails released at Site B have a survival rate of 55%. That's not enough to survive. The snails released at Mount Rockford are more fortunate, with a survival rate of 79%, which still isn't enough for long-term survival. With the end of the snail collection, Solid Energy Diggers then moved the vegetation 800 meters north of the mining site. At this point, the VGT is an experimental and untried restoration method, but there is hope for recovery. Attempting to delay further mining, Safe Happy Valley set up a permanent camp on the mining site. In response, Solid Energy Guards are posted to monitor and watch them. Later on, the campers catch two suspicious men in camouflage clothing on a neighboring ridge. When pressed, Solid Energy confirms that they are not employees. But when asked if the men worked for the private investigations company, Thompson & Clark, they refused to comment. Not letting the security presence affect them, other protesters scale the Solar Energy headquarters and suspend themselves in midair to hold up a banner. They are eventually arrested, after the police break down the door of a ram. During all of this, the media is mostly featuring Solar Energy. They make use of this opportunity, painting the environmentalists as dangerous anarchists who want to take away people's jobs. This escalates the violence against the conservationists. Peter Lusk, a spokesman for Forest and Bird, had his mailbox exploded with a pipe bomb. He also received threatening phone calls and had his house attacked with rocks. The man refuses to leave his home, refusing to let them win. The animosity of the West Coast towards environmentalists is well known and has deep roots. The economy and thus jobs of the region are reliant on mining and logging. Coal is part of West Coast history and culture. It's something they've done for generations and hold pride in. With the central government trying to cut emissions and increase conservation efforts in the 1970s, there was a feeling of having their way of life forcibly taken away from them. Coal companies are a central part of life there, funding essential services, empowering industry. They sponsor schools, fundraise events, and run tours. The region is reliant on them, and they run deep. Hence the anger towards conservationists, with protest action and violence against them. On a lighter note, 
Safe Happy Valley released about 150 inflatable kiwis in a Wellington park. Then they dressed up as miners to capture those scary kiwis. In a later statement, Solid Energy admitted to the use of Thompson & Clark services. They were attempting to hire spies to monitor the Safe Happy Valley activities. Don Elder remarked, None of this should come as any surprise. It's what businesses do. Hidden cameras are then found at the occupation site. With 27 times zoom, over 100 meters of cable, and a hard drive. Safe Happy Valley's next move is to hang on to the edge of the blast exclusion zone, preventing the use of explosives to expand the mine. They are able to avoid arrest this time, as they are on public conservation land. Later on, they once again attempt to chain self the train track maneuver. They manage to haul up trains for three and a half hours before the police arrest three activists. Turns out, Thompson and Clark have been monitoring and infiltrating other activist groups for years, even before Safe Happy Valley had even existed. An expose was released by investigative reporter Nikki Hager, with particular interest paid to state on enterprise use of the company. There was enough outcry that then Prime Minister Helen Clark rebuked Solar Energy. Don Elder chose to respond by backing up Thompson and Clark. We will not discuss any details of our security arrangements. We stand behind Thompson and Clark Investigations Limited and their work for us. Their activities are legal, moral, and ethical. While this was going on, Safe Happy Valley were dressing the members up as Kiwi, Kakariki, and Geckos. When the Minister of Conservation walked by them, they pretended to get blown away by a fake coal mining blast. Around 2010, Gavin Clark of Thompson & Clark was caught on tape while trying to recruit an informant. Clark had offered Rob Gilchrist $300 for logins to internal communications, along with $500 a week for information to save Happy Valley. Gilchrist said, I think you could find that you might be on the front page of the Sunday paper again. Clark replied, Yeah, that wouldn't be a good look, would it? The recordings were then given to Nikki Hager who released the information into the Sunday Star Times. Gilchrist was later exposed as a police informant of 10 years, spying on environmentalists and peace organizations. He had asked his girlfriend, an activist from Safe Happy Valley, to fix his computer. He forgot that he had incriminating emails open on a browser tab. The police were paying him $600 a week, proving that Thompson & Clark was clearly underpaying. In response to this, Safe Happy Valley alongside other organizations, brought out complaints to the private investigator's registrar. The complaint failed, as the paid informants weren't legally classified as employees, making them unlicensed operators, not under their control. Thompson and Clark are later caught illegally planting tracking devices on activists, with a black box found under a car. Solar Energy then premiered Snail the movie, costing a total of $50,000. Don Elder preemptively said, we never intended this to be a propaganda movie, although I'm sure some will see it that way. It cuts out the court battles and activist action, leaving the effort that solid energy is spent on relocating and housing the snails. The film can still be seen on YouTube today, with a total of 4,400 views. As a load of solid energy coal is about to be shipped off to France, the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior 2, the first having been limped and mined by French commandos, blockaded. Greenpeace protesters used grappling hooks to climb and unfurl a banner on the coal ship as crew members tried to hose them off. The ship is delayed for three hours before six activists are arrested. After three years of delays, Solid Energy finally chooses to crack down on the Safe Happy Valley occupation. They set up a 480 hectare exclusion zone around the Stockton mine. All trespassers will face prosecution. Their camp is torn down. And in response, the Safe Happy Valley protesters moved their camp to the company's front lawn, where they declare they will be there indefinitely. At Solar Energy's annual conference, four Safe Happy Valley protesters bust in dressed as Santa. They called on order a very naughty boy. Then, they try to pour coal on him, followed by a pie. Both the pie and coal miss. The meeting descends into chaos, with security dragging the protesters out. On the snail front, a further 1,600 snails translocated to the recreated site, with 2,300 snails moved to two other sites in nearby Mount Rockford. Forest and bird visit the restored sites, only to find them desolate. Pictures are taken, 
but the conditions needed for the snails are long gone. 30% from this batch of snails will die within 18 months. Landcare Research was aware that the snail populations could not survive with such losses. While VDT was focused on during court cases, the site was also restored using treated stockpile soil. Stockpile soil can be used successfully, but it takes time, with ultra-slow release fertilizers and root fungi inoculation. Instead, the mine soil is heavily treated with biosolids, as in treated sewage sludge. It formed about 20% of the returned soil. This heavily affected the microbiome, preventing root fungi colonization. Without the root fungi, the plants cannot take in nutrients long term. Plant shoots grew rapidly, but the root growth couldn't keep up. This further worsened nutrient uptake. Even worse for the snails, the mining had killed the local endemic earthworms that they had relied on for food. They couldn't survive the elevated heavy metal and nutrient levels. The plants were only surviving with nutrients from the biosolid treatment. When the biosolid treatment ended, so did the plants. Weeds soon overtook the fields, as they were more suited to the treated soil than the native fauna. VDT always suffers from significant dieback initially, and it takes years to recover, during which the area is bare land, unsuited for life. Unfortunately, VDT is not a guaranteed process, and the vegetation may fail to recover. Even by 2018, the VDT sites were still in poor shape and not suited for snail transfer. Solid Energy declared success, cherry picking data from the one site that backed up their views. Stockton Mine has since been used as a case study an example of cost-effective mine restoration programs. The current state of the restored area is not taken into account. In 2011, a temperature probe in one of the storage units malfunctioned, leading to half the snails freezing to death. To prevent this from happening again, the temperature probes are now linked to phone alarms. In 2015, eight years after the initial rehabilitation plan, the Department of Conservation overhauled the whole program. Habitat-wise, Biosolids and fertilizers were cut, while long-term predator and weed control measures were implemented. Snail housing-wise, the snails continue to be kept under the best possible conditions, with a focus on health and survival. The plan also called for the releasing of surplus snails to avoid overcrowding in Hokotika. From 2013 to 2020, 4,410 eggs and 4,584 snails were released. The snails were released to the sites with the highest survival rates, recorded at 84% in 2012. It's now 2012 and China's economy is slowing, reducing the demand for coal. Alongside this, the Chinese government was implementing anti-pollution laws as a reaction to the mass environmental protests. Both of these factors combined to drastically drop coal prices. As a coal company, Solid energy was hit hard. Workers are laid off year after year at the Stockton mine. That was only part of the picture of solid energy. At mines around New Zealand, workers were made redundant and mines were more full. These cost-cutting measures failed to increase net profit. In 2013, Don Alder stepped down in favour of Jerry Dyack, and the government provided solid energy of 100 million in loans. A year later, they took away 100 million of their debt. Even with the help, Solid Energy is failing to recover. The company eventually went into voluntary administration and had its assets sold to other mining entities. In 2018, Solid Energy was liquidated and that's where their story ends. From 2014 to 2016, Thompson and Clark were monitoring insurance policyholders who were struggling to sell their claims after the crash to show quick. This eventually led to a report by the State Services Commission in 2018, which was expanded after Greenpeace leaked a number of MBIE documents. The report revealed that from 2005 to 2018, numerous government entities had used Thomson & Clark services, ranging from providing security to direct monitoring and surveillance. Thomson & Clark had legally used the motor vehicle registry to obtain information such as names, addresses and phone numbers. They had also used personal contacts from multiple government agencies to recruit and find work, giving them access to government information and contracts. Following the report, the company was removed as preferred supplier for government agencies. After losing their government contracts, Thompson and Clark then swapped to working for oil and gas companies, 
monitoring and providing reports on climate change activists for use in suppressing protests. This included school children and grandparents from a school track for climate protests. In 2021, it was discovered that the exclusive Brevin cult were using their services. They were spying on former members of the church who were just trying to live a normal life. Thompson and Clark have since rebranded as two separate companies, Risk Management Services Limited and Omnis Videntes Limited, but they continue to operate in exactly the same way. After their camp was torn down, the Safe Happy Valley Coalition gradually drifted apart. Pictures of the mine land were shared via email amongst them. It was difficult for them, and many felt like they had lost. Some of them left, moving on with their lives. While some of them joined other activist groups, such as Greenpeace or All Free Wellington. Their main successor seems to be Co-Action Aotearoa. They use similar tactics of protests and publicity stunts, whilst coordinating more with other environmental groups nationwide for both protests and petition. Forest and Bird continue to battle against mines in New Zealand. Their main opponent on the west coast is Bathurst Resources, now the biggest coal miner in New Zealand. They failed to stop the escarpment and Takadimo mines. However, they managed to prevent the Kuha mine. Recently, bills to ban mining conservation land alongside seabed mining have both been struck down, meaning there will be many more protests to come in the following years. Solar energy funding for the snail housing ended in 2016. Responsibility for funding the restoration and snail housing were then transferred to the government under the Department of Conservation. Director Mark Davis then accelerated the plans to close the snail housing, returning the snails to the wild prematurely. However, reports by DOC staff stated an early release would lead to extinction of the rare salvan moth and would be more expensive than keeping the habitat. Dr. Walker also advised to maintain the snail housing and create a separate habitat for them to live in. Alongside this, suitable release sites were small due to the trouble rehabilitation, and for the snails were released, they could be easily wiped out all at once by an unforeseen event, such as a fire or natural disaster. Fortunately for the snails, they were listed in the threatened species strategy, setting them as a priority species for recovery. Alongside the expert recommendations, the snail habitat was saved from shutting down. As of 2023, the snail housing is still up. There's a new recovery plan being worked on, and the snails will only be released when there's full confidence they will survive. That is good news for a snail that's gone through much. I hope their moss will be soft and their worms tasty, for their future seems bright.